the Bull Simons Award, named after the legendary Colonel Arthur Bull Simons and presented by the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. It honors the spirit, values, and skills of the Special Operations Warrior. We pay tribute to an individual whose Medal of Honor, two distinguished service crosses, the Silver Star, and numerous other awards from his service in Vietnam, set the heroic tone for the rest of his military career, and which provide an example for generations of special operators. Colonel Robert L. Howard. Copy, diligent four two. You have cover for your slick. I've got guns. Roger, diligent. We got a set on uh, the slick. Stand by in case we catch more fire. We need to call you up. Roger, over in south. Stand by one, call three. How much ordinance you got? Okay, I got the folding boards right now. Okay, you want to escort the guys in because we're just about empty. Okay, we're fine. And uh, come on, too. What's your position? MACV SOG was a military assistance command Vietnam studies and observations group. SOG was responsible for all the top secret, covert, deniable operations conducted cross border outside South Vietnam. So beginning in 1965, that meant recon and hatchet force missions and other special operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail corridor in Laos. This was the primary route that the North Vietnamese used to supply their troops in the south. To give you an idea of, of what that meant, at its high point, that was about 2,500 miles of paved roads. So the North Vietnamese had up to 10,000 trucks there running supplies to the south. And after the bombing halt in North Vietnam, they moved 10,000 anti-aircraft guns to protect that highway structure. Here we were sneaking into it. The Special Forces Studies Operation Group was divided into three main camps. They had Command Control South, which is in Bami Tuat. They had Command Control Central in Kantum. And then they had Command Control North, which I think was up in Da Nang. MACB SOG missions were normally uh, harassment and interdiction along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Recovery of American POWs, mining missions, ambush missions, we had road watch missions, we had wiretap missions, uh, but SOG SLAM, S-L-A-M, was search, locate, annihilate, and monitor. And the, the, the root of the mission was to go out in the operational area to make contact with a larger military force and to hold that target until such time as a hatchet force or an airstrike could destroy it. Uh, we wanted to make a major effort to take control of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I first met Bob Howard when I was assigned to RT Nevada, which was a recon team. He was a quiet man, but he always wanted to do something. And I remember when there was a dangerous mission to go on, he would want to go on it because he was someone who had lived through it and done it. It was his DNA. This is what he was supposed to do, and that's a sign of a, of a man. That's a sign of a soldier, a true soldier. 1967. I had to send eight recon teams to Contoon. And we had to change, it, change the mission. We was running in Cambodia and we was getting the eight teams ready to go into Laos. And I got up there and Robert Howard was a supply sergeant. And he's six. I would say he probably run 25 or 30 missions more than the average recon man would have run in, in that length of time. When Bob Howard arrived at Command and Control Central, started running recon in 1967, there were some discrepancies in the organization. It was not fully fleshed out with kind of logistic support you should have. And the amazing thing is, within the uh, entire compound, he was the only one who had been school trained early in his career as a supply specialist. So here he would run recon missions, come back, and while his teammates were on stand down, blowing steam, having fun, he would be spending that week in the supply office filling out uh, requisition forms because he was the only guy who knew how to do it. He didn't have to do that, but he cared enough about the unit, enough about the mission that by golly, everybody else go have fun. Bob Howard's gonna make sure we get the supplies we need. I think that's part of the reason a lot of us are humble about having been in combat because we saw, as he did, that it's, it's not about patting yourself on the back. It's about the men you serve with and how well you do what you're supposed to do. 
you know, everybody in the outfit, above and below, had the utmost respect for him. He was a man of action. He didn't like to sit around. When it was time to do something and no one stepped up to the plate, he was going to step up to the plate. And by force of personality, he dragged a lot of people with him. He, and he made a lot of people better people. He was a very fine man, easy to get along with. From the very moment I met him, never once did I ever know him to do anything that solely benefited himself. He never tried to promote himself. He never put himself in positions where he'd get admiration. The man was always supportive of the troops and primarily supportive of the mission. A classic example of one of the things he did, he was wounded in the hospital, so he thought he was doing pretty good, so he goes AWOL in the hospital. He goes down to play coup to eat. There's a motorbike that comes to a halt, and some of our men are standing in line waiting to get into the chow hall. One Vietnamese jumps off the back and throws a grenade. And our guys saw him stop. They, they jumped for cover, and they were all right. Now, most human beings would go, woo, that was close. No, 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 Bob Howard, with no hesitation, takes careful aim, boom! He shoots the Vietnamese on the back. He goes down. The bike turned over, then he outrun the other one about a half a mile down the road and killed him. He come on back, got in the chow line, got his chow, didn't even report it. Some men hear gunfire, they run from it. Some men, like Bob Howard, hear gunfire, they run to it. First of all, I was ambushed and I was unconscious. A blast must have blew me back and blew me upside down and I was just crumpled up on the ground. And when I finally uh, uh, was in a state of coming to, I couldn't see and blood running down my face and that was what was in my eyes, I couldn't see. My weapon had just blown all to hell and then I realized what in the world did I survive to blow that weapon up like that? And then at that point in time, I could hear the lieutenant screaming, and that's when I had to totally ignore the enemy situation and my wounds. He's quite a ways from me, and I couldn't walk, so I had to crawl over to him. And so as I start dragging him away, we get attacked by an enemy a frontal attack again, three or four of the enemy, and one of the sergeants that was with that were in the platoon, one of the squad leaders, was back down the hill a little ways, and he saw what I was doing as I crawled to him. He started laying down a base of fire and, and killed those enemy soldiers that were attacking me. But in that process, one of them fired a weapon, and he riddled me across the center of my body and the ammo pouches blew up with the ammunition and actually picked me up off the ground and blew me away from it. Now, this is a split second that I didn't want to go back. But to even hesitate not to go back, uh, it makes you feel so bad. You got to do what's right, and it was right. If I didn't do it, there was nobody else there to do it. Who else is going to do it? You got to make a decision. You know, everybody else was, uh, they were either dead or wounded or they in a position trying to help me. I had to go back, you know, but I didn't want to go back because I was aware of the situation. I was wounded pretty bad and I knew I was wounded pretty bad and I know the condition of the lieutenant and I know that there's nobody else that's going to be able to get that lieutenant but me and I didn't want to go back, but I did. As I tried to get into the mortar pit and jumped over the sandbags, I got hit in the foot. And about that time, uh, uh, one of the captains that was in our tactical operations center was trying to run me down to, with a 312 telephone and say, I got the chief of staff of the Army on the telephone. He's calling all the way from Washington, D.C. Uh, really, I, I thought they were kidding me when they said General Westmoreland. And he said, Bob. He says, uh, how you doing? I said, sir, the situation is pretty damn bad here. I said, how you doing? <laughs> you know, I said, hey, you want my honest opinion? It's pretty bad right now. <laughs> Plus, my foot hurts. I just got shot in it. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, congratulations. He says, we're going to award you the Medal of Honor. 
And I said, sir, I really appreciate that honor. But I said, I think I'm going to have a problem getting out of here. He said, no, you won't. When Bob Howard was put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor and the policy, whether it was a camp policy or, or headquarters policy or army policy, I don't know, was put on stand down. He was not allowed to go back into the field. He really had no way of, of getting rid of his anxiety sitting back at camp. I don't know if he went on his R&Rs, I know that, but I don't think he really knew how to relax just walking around camp. So during this period of uh, when he was not allowed to go out in the field, he was kind of like just roaming around, like, what do I do? And he was always meeting teams. He was always, you know, he's in the, all the briefings and things like that. And he was trying to just stay active and I by, you know, by standing close to the action or so to speak. Uh, you know, I'm sure Sergeant Howard would have been running hatchet forces and, and recon teams today if he was still, still with us and if he was still uh, not grounded. <laughs> I lived in Temple, Texas at the time, and a limo came and picked us up. But it was my first realization as to what my father had been doing. And so I was sort of caught up in the moment of, well, I've always known my daddy was a hero and the best man ever, and now everybody else, you know, knows this. When President Nixon came down, and I looked up at my father's face, and it was just solid as stone, but his eyes, I could just, see in his eyes so many thoughts going on through his brain, but his face was just like. One thing my father wanted to do was go to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I had asked him, what is, what is this? You know, and he explained to me, and I could feel just all the emotion of that these men had families, these men had served their country, these men, and, and I sort of got the feeling of what it was about. And as we walked off, he turned to me very quickly, he patted my shoulder and he looked in my eyes and he said, you get it. And I said, I do get it. And then he was back to being the soldier. When I first met Major Howard, I knew nothing about him. While we were there staying in the tar pa paper uh, Quonset huts, the students, through talk and banter, kind of understood that, that he was somebody special. Didn't know why exactly, knew that he had, uh, uh, was a Vietnam era uh, soldier and that had seen uh, quite a bit of action. Didn't know at the time that he was a Medal of Honor winner. And I was called to his room or where he uh, stayed while the course was in session. I'm assuming to get some guidance for the day. And when I reported in, uh, he called me in and he was changing after the morning PT. Uh, when his back was to me and he was taking his shirt off, at that point I saw you know, a number of his wounds and at that point I thought to myself, wow, you know, what, what everybody had said was true. He'd been through quite a bit earlier in his career. And so at that point I knew that he was, uh, uh, he was the real deal. We got up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock for a rucksack run. Major Howard always led those. Every single time that I can remember, he was always in front. He was always leading. It was a physical and a mental thing. It seemed like it went on forever. As we approached the gate of Camp McCall, Major Howard let us pass the gate and continued on for another quarter, half a mile that we didn't know at the time. As soon as we passed the gate, immediately there was just a onslaught of people just dropping out and saying, that's it, I can't, I can't push it any further. So when Major Howard did that little mind game, you thought to yourself, oh my gosh, you know, how long is this going to go on? Well, again, he circled back, went into the gates at that point, and gathered everybody that succeeded, stood in front of us and said, looked at all of us and said, I tell you what, men, if I had a battalion of you, I would take you all to the DMZ and I'd dare those North Korean sons of bitches to come over because you could lick them all. I guarantee everybody's chest at that point just kind of swelled up, head went back a little bit full of pride because the man that was leading this, us this whole time, who was, you know, what, 20, 25 years our senior at least, 
and could beat any one of us physically just gave us such a, uh, uh, an attaboy, an attribute that you know, at that point you knew you couldn't fail, that you just had to keep driving, uh, driving on for yourself certainly and, and, and for him because he believed in you. I first met Colonel Bob Howard in August of 1990. I was a relatively senior captain in the intel field. However, I had not heard of Colonel Howard. When I went into his office, uh, I received a, a feeling that he would know within 30 seconds if he liked you or if he did not. As it turns out, he did like me. He offered me the job to be his targeting intel officer for Special Operations Command Korea. The only words he gave to me was basically, don't screw up, don't do anything dumb. He left me on my own. I was immediately impressed with the reverence that the senior Korean officers uh, gave to, to Colonel Howard. It was only then, after a period of a couple weeks, I was able to ascertain that uh, you know, I, was, uh, I was working for a, for a true hero. Uh, when I arrived in Korea, I was not familiar with the awards uh, that Colonel Howard had received for his Vietnam service. Uh, it was later on that I found out that uh, I was in the presence of, of a true American hero. I was president of the Medal of Honor Society uh, for four years, and the last two years of uh, my presidency of the Society, uh, Colonel Howard was my vice president. We was contacted by the Armed Forces Entertainment Network in Washington, D.C., uh, asking if we could get a group of Medal of Honor recipients that would like to visit the troops. He wanted to be back in uniform so bad. And when he was talking to the troops, it was leadership. It, it was positive motivation. It was as if he was their colonel, and he was sharp. He, he, he hadn't lost anything. And up to the day he died, he read constantly. He was still as military sharp as you could be. And, and the troops could identify that, and they really appreciated him being there. Colonel Howard realized that he was dying. He had cancer and he did not have long to live. From his hospital bed in Texas, he uh, took time to work on his uniform to make sure it was just right. He wasn't afraid to die. He probably many times thought he was going to die. And uh, he accepted that. I really couldn't reconcile with his death till this past summer. And uh, when they dedicated at Fort Campbell, you know, a building, the hall, to my father, in meeting the different men and, and, and talking with them, it's just like a, a, a weight had been lifted off of me. And I felt ready to, to, to accept the fact that he was gone and that that was his life. Colonel Howard always in my presence uh, was the utmost professional, yet the most humble of, uh, of any of the senior officers that I had, uh, had ever come across or have since met. He had one thing in his office. It was a picture of Audie Murphy. On the corner of that photo that was framed, was a set of Audie Murphy's dog tags given him by Audie Murphy's family. He pointed it out one day and said, you know, I'm just a soldier. That man up there was a hero. Bob Howard commanded such respect due to his abilities, his courage, and his spirit that he was always ready to go. You couldn't hold him back. For those of us running on the ground, and I ran on the ground for more than, more than a year while he was there, just the knowledge that if you got in big trouble, if you were wounded, left somewhere out in the jungle, that Bob Howard would climb on a helicopter and do whatever it took, no matter the risk to himself, to come get you, that was reassuring. That was the kind of guy Bob Howard was. You could count on him 100%, no matter what. It was Bob Howard. He was a shining example of what every special operations operator should be. Toughest man I ever met in my life. 
He was a, he was a soldier soldier.